So I invite you to, to join in, maybe um, if you've been observing from the outside, maybe take a couple of steps in, dip your toe in the water, and uh, lift up your voice and sing. And if you don't know the words, that's all right. Um, just follow along and uh, spend some time worshiping.
Feel free to write it on that section and you can stick it in the white tie box at the end of service. With that, let's pray for our offering. Uh, we are halfway through our series in Revelation. Through the summer, or at the beginning of summer, we started going through the book of Revelation. The last two weeks we took a break, but we are back in that series that's titled Ready. Um, it's taking a little bit longer than we thought it would, but that's okay. I think Revelation is a cool book to spend some time in. And this morning, to begin, I'd like to share or start with a story that Jesus shares in Luke chapter 19. It's a story that I think will help us understand Revelation chapter 11. So, uh, you can just follow along. You don't have to turn to Luke 19. You can follow along on the slides behind me. But let's read together. So Luke 19, starting in verse 11. Jesus said, or it says this, The crowd was listening to everything Jesus said. And because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. He said... A nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, Invest this for me while I am gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We do not want him to be our king. After he was crowned king, he returned and called in his servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first servant reported, Master, I've invested your money, and I made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You are a good servant. You have been faithful with the little I entrusted you, so you will be governor of ten cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money, and I made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and I kept it safe. I was afraid because you are a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared. Your own words condemn you. If you knew that I was a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then, turning to others standing by, the king ordered, Take the money from this servant, the one that didn't invest it, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has ten pounds. But master, they said, he already has ten pounds. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even with what little they have, will, will be, even what little they have will be taken away. And as for these enemies of mine who don't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. Jesus, in this story, he tells about a man who was supposed to be a king of a land. However, he had business, other business to attend to, so he couldn't be king right away. He had to go off, handle that business, and then he was going to come back. But before he came back, he sent his ten servants, and he gave them what was, was about equivalent to three months' salary. And he said, hey, take this, invest it, do business on my behalf. And prepare the land for my arrival. And as we read, some of the servants served their, their, their future king faithfully. They invested what they were given and they multiplied their investment. Again, as we read, the people of the land did not want this new guy to be their king. And you can only imagine that if they didn't want this new king to be the king, they all also didn't want his servants around. And so that meant that the ten servants he left behind would have to do business in a harsh work environment. They had to do business with people who initially didn't like them. And so it would have been a very tough job. But the good news is, is that they had a good business. And those willing to risk doing the king's business saw major profits. Not only that, when the king came back and heard about how they multiplied their investment, the king rewarded them big time. 
And now, not only would they get coins from the king, but they would actually get cities from the king. It's good to work hard for the king. And I believe this story here in Luke chapter 19 can help us understand what's also known as the most difficult chapter in Revelation. And that would be Revelation chapter 11. If you were to spend any time studying or reading Bible commentaries about Revelation chapter 11, you would quickly see that there are endless debates about how to interpret this chapter. There are questions about, should we take this chapter literally? Or should we take it symbolically? Or maybe it's a mixture of both. And while interpreting the details of this chapter, Revelation chapter 11, can be complex, I think that the overall message that this chapter communicates is actually simple. And it's this principle. The king has a job for us to do. The king has a job for us to do. Now, three weeks ago, we left off in Revelation chapter 11 with the Apostle John being told this. It says in Revelation chapter 10, verse 11, it says, And I was told, John speaking, you must prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. What that means, and, 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 since we're not really able to look at the context, but what's, what's going on here is God has given John a job. And he wants John to go and tell the world his message. And this message that John was supposed to communicate to the world wasn't going to be an easy message. It was described in chapter 10 as a message that was both sweet to his mouth, but would be bitter in his stomach. It would be this picture of something that was both good, but hard. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I know that sometimes difficulties or the fact that something is hard can keep us or even keep myself from doing a job. It might be a good job. It might be an extremely rewarding job. But if it's hard, I'll double, I'll, I'll think twice about it. Maybe I'll even pass on it. Maybe I might start, but then give up once I see how really hard it is. However, some things are too important to give up on. And John's job, the one he's getting from God in chapter 10, is extremely important. He had to do that. In fact, when it says that you must again prophesy or must go and speak God's word, that word must there means it's a divine obligation that God has said, I have created you and picked you out and I have determined that you are the person that must do this. And so it was important that John do this job. He had to do it, even if it was hard, even if it was really difficult. Which means that John might have to sacrifice to do this job. He may even have to take risks to finish this job. And I think that as John was thinking about it, thinking about, man, this is a big job. God's given me a lot of responsibility. And it's going to be a hard job. It's going to be a difficult one. I think he may be a little bit nervous. And so, God, and so, and so God's considering that. But here's what's cool. God, God knows how we are. God knows that as humans, we can get scared to do tough things. God knows that we can be weak. God knows that many times we lack faith. We struggle to believe that God will take care of us. <coughs> but God, even knowing that, instead of getting frustrated with us, instead of slapping us against the, uh, on the back of the head and saying, hey, why don't you get your act together? What he actually does is comes alongside us and encourages us. And I think that's what's happening here in chapter 11. God knows that John's a little bit nervous about the big responsibility he's been given. So he determines to encourage John to do his hard job by showing him a vision of the future. And that vision is listed in Revelation chapter 11. So Revelation chapter 11 verse 1 starts off this way. John says, Then I was given a measuring rod, like a staff. And I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar of those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now, as you can see in, the, in just these two verses, 
some of this is really confusing. Like, what, what the heck is John talking about here? What is, is, he, is he measuring a literal future temple? It, 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 or is this temple supposed to be symbolic? It, it, it's, why is he only measuring part of it and then leaving out some of it? And, and what does it even mean for John to measure something? Again, we are going to spend a, 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 we're not going to spend time breaking down what could be the multiple views of how to interpret this passage. But what we are going to talk about is something that I believe is a major point of this passage. Now, who has seen the movie Finding Nemo? You, it's okay. You can raise your hand. All right. Who knows what these guys say? Mine. Yes. Ex John, can you say that again? I like the way you said it. Yeah. These guys, they love saying mine, 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 mine. Right? Okay, so I show you this because in this passage, do you know what it means for God to request John to measure something? You know what God is, is trying to show him? He is trying to show it for, for something to be measured means that God is saying mine, mine. When you measure something, or what John measured, means that he was measuring that which belonged to God. And so, we, again, technically we know, or on a side note, technically we know that everything belongs to God. But as we will see, sometimes God allows others to have temporary control of his possessions. But the reason why he measures is because he's trying to show John, this belongs to me. Again, while this passage can definitely refer to a literal future Jerusalem temple being rebuilt, and John measuring that, if he didn't know, there is no current Jewish temple in Jerusalem. And so some believe that in the future that will be rebuilt. And that this passage may be talking about that. And maybe also talking about part of that temple being overtaken by the nations. I also believe that there is a symbolic aspect of this passage. I believe that when we consider that which is measured of this temple and that which is levered out, uh, left out, it can refer to, at least symbolically, God protecting his people. And that would be the part that was measured. God protecting his people, specifically spiritually. And then the part that wasn't measured or the part that was left out, referring to God allowing bad things to happen to his people specifically physically it would be symbol it would be symbolically portrayed by the outer court being left out or being not being measured or being overran and so i think we see those two things symbolically now look at verses 3 through 6 it goes on to say and this is god speaking and i will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. And if anyone would harm them, this is how they would be doomed to be killed. They have power to shut the sky that no rain may fall for the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. God shows John that in these last days, in this future vision, two witnesses appear. And these witnesses, they belong to God. And just like John, they have a job to do. They have a message to prophesy or, or to speak forth coming from God. And again, I believe there's a lot of possible symbolism in this passage. Uh, it talks about that there they, they are, are, are two olive trees or two lampstands. And, and, and that's referencing something that's found in the Old Testament, actually in the book of Zechariah, where the prophet Zechariah uses those two same pictures, olive trees and lampstands, to describe Jerusalem's rulers and Jerusalem's priests, those who were filled with the Holy Spirit to accomplish God's will. And so it could be symbolically connecting with that. We also see, or we also read that these two witnesses, they have supernatural pro prophetic powers. Similar to, if you are familiar with the prophet Elijah, or even Moses, you will see that they, they can do the same things that Elijah and Moses did. 
Now, if we consider this again symbolically, it could, this passage could symbolize the church, who the Bible says are the kings and priests of the Lord. And so it's the church symbolically represented, supernaturally protected by God as they go forth and accomplish God's will by the Spirit's power. That's a, a, a possible symbolic interpretation of these verses. But I'm going to go down a small, very brief rabbit trail just for a second. And I actually believe that these, these two witnesses that, that John has a vision for, I actually believe they will be literal people that will appear one day in the future. But who are they? There are a ton of theories about who these two could be. But this is the one I like. Now, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says this. It is appointed for man to die once, and then comes the judgment. That's just a fancy way of saying everybody's supposed to die. Now, as far as we know, or at least in the scriptures, there are only two people in the Bible who have never died. Does anybody know who they are? Elijah's one. Who's, who's the other? Enoch. Enoch. All right. I, I think, I could be wrong about this. I think... The two witnesses are supposed to be Elijah and Enoch. Especially since both of them have never died, then it would make sense that if everybody's supposed to die once, now of course that's, that's the general rule, not like an absolute rule, but if everybody's supposed to die once, then hey, wouldn't it make sense that two prophets and Elijah and Enoch were both prophetic, that, that these, these two guys, if they never died, if they were taken up to heaven without dying, you know, maybe they're the two witnesses to come back. It seems to be fitting since they need to die once. Now, what does all of that have to do with the point of the passage? Nothing. I just think it's really cool. Um, but regardless of who they are, what we see here in these verses is that these men, these two witnesses, faithfully do the job that God's given them. And God, as they do it, God supernaturally protects them as they work for him. But then we read this. Revelation 11 verse 7 goes on to say, and when they finished their testimony, that's the two witnesses, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some of the peoples and the tribes and the languages and the nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange uh, presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet. And great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at the hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. As we move on, we see something crazy happens. It talks about that there's this beast that rises up out of the bottomless pit. It's likely what, what we know as, uh, as the person of the Antichrist. We're going to talk more about him next week. So if you're interested about that, come next week. But this beast is, uh, is, is able to come out of the bottomless pit. And then he's, he is allowed to kill the two witnesses. Notice how I said, allowed. And after they do that, it says the entire world rejoices. Everybody is so happy. And they kind of like create the second Christmas to celebrate the fact that these guys died. They, they hated these servants of God. They hated their message that they always preach. They were, it says that they were tormented by it. They were tortured by hearing the word of God spoken to them over and over by these two witnesses. And so when they finally are allowed to die... They don't even, the people of the world don't even bury them and they start giving presents to one another to celebrate that. It was like this ultimate sign of disrespect. But, it goes on to say that after three and a half days, something miraculous happens. God raises them from the dead in front of everybody and he proves to the world that, they, that these guys are mine. They belong to me. 
And it says, and, and it literally, for the rest of the world, it literally rocks their world. But look what also happens. It says that they, that means the, the rest of the world, who, who, who loved the fact that they died, but now they saw them ri uh, rise from the dead. It, it, it says that they were terrified and gave glory to God. Now, wherever this word in the original language, the Greek language, wherever the word terrified is used in Scripture, it refers to a fear that leads people toward God. And so strangely, God even uses the death of his prophets to accomplish his work. Now, chapter 11 ends with this. Verse 14 says, the second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. For you have begun to take, or you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for the rewarding of your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for the destroying of the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened. And the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. And there was flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an, and, and an earthquake, and heavy hail. Three main messages to close out this chapter. One, it says that the seventh trumpet sounds. What, what does that mean? It means that time is almost up. What does that mean? It means, the second main thing that's communicated is that the king is coming back. Actually, at this point, he's almost here. And, and you can see that in, in, if you've been with us through Revelation, you will know that a couple of times God has been referred to in, in this way. It says that God is the one who is and who was and who is to come. But notice that verse 17 says who is and who was. But there is no longer who is to come. Why? Because at this point in the vision of the future, at this point, the king is already at the gate. And, he's, and since he's back, he's going to fulfill his promises. And that's the third message that's communicated in the last part of this chapter. God is now ready to fulfill all of his promises. He's ready to establish his kingdom. And that's, that's what the picture of the heavenly ark symbolizes. You guys may know uh, 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 about the ark if, if you've read the Old Testament or maybe you've just watched Indiana Jones. But the ark was a symbol of God's presence and promise. And so just like in Luke chapter 19, the story we read, we read at the beginning, when the king comes back, people are either going to be rewarded or judged in his presence according to his promise. And so with all that said, let, let me summarize real quick, real, real quick the vision that John has been given right after he's also been given a very hard job. We started out talking about that to, to, there was going to be this measurement of the temple, which again reminds us that we belong to God. And God takes care of those that he owns. But God also allows difficult things to happen to us the same way that he will allow this future temple to be overran by the nations. We also heard that, that, that there are these two witnesses that will come and they will prophesy, they will speak God's word. But people will not like these two guys and they'll try to kill them. But they are also supernaturally protected by God. They preach God's word and no one will be able to hurt them. They're going to be like Mario when he has star power. You guys know what Mario's star power it looks like this? See, there's Mario. When he gets a star, nobody can touch it. How many, like, look at this in run right here. Do, do, do. When he goes up, how many are, like, holding down B? Remember holding down B? Yep. 
and then also like triggering A so that you could get the running start and get to the top of the flag. That has nothing, again, that has nothing to do with the sermon. Um, but these two witnesses are protected like Mario when he got the star. But after their job is done, God allows them to be killed, these two witnesses. And while the world thinks that they won, God declares a different winner. And even in the death of the two witnesses, God actually wins. And so not only does he raise them from the dead, but it says that after that, after that happens, it says that the people who hated the servants and, and really hated God, it says that they actually begin to fear God and glorify him. And so it's, it's kind of like this win-win that happens on God's behalf. And so as John re, uh, receives this incredibly hard assignment, I think that this vision that he is given in chapter 11 would have been incredibly encouraging. And I think that this morning, as we have gone through chapter 11, I believe it also should be encouraging to us. And so as we close today, I want to remind us that God has given each one of us, if we call ourselves Christians, or if we call ourselves Jesus followers, God has given us a job. And it is a simple job. The job is go and preach the gospel. Go and tell everybody about Jesus and make disciples. That's easy. But although, or I mean, that's, that's simple. But although it's simple, it's not always easy. It actually can be hard. It can be hard because we live in a world where people, there's a large majority of people who don't want the new coming king. It's a place that will celebrate the death of the king's servants, maybe in reputation or maybe in physically. We live in a place where, where people can look at Christians and, and be like, maybe this is at work, maybe at school, wherever we're at. It could be like, uh, uh, finally, those born again, they're gone. Finally, they, they're not here anymore. Or I'm so glad that that Jesus freak got fired. And in some places in the world, people will be glad when Christians are dead. This is all, this world, it's a hard place to do business for the king. And so maybe you're here this morning and you find yourself scared to do business for the king. Maybe you ask yourself, what, people, what will people think about me if they find out that I'm a Christian? What will happen if I actually fully surrender my life to Jesus and live for him? How's that going to change my life? Am I going to like what that change is going to be like? Will people hate me if I share the gospel with them? Will people hate me if I invite people to church? Will they make fun of me because I follow Jesus? And this morning, I'm here to tell you that all of those things and even more, all of those things are possible. I, I mean, it, it, it stinks, but Jesus said himself, if, if they hate me, he was referring to himself, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. And so church family, it's, it comes with the job. It comes with the territory that, that people may not like us because we're Christians. But that doesn't mean we should give up. Because remember, just like the two witnesses, the king has our back. He will protect us. If he gives us a job, you better believe he's going to give us the resources and protection to accomplish that job. And additionally, he's going to reward us. Now, sometimes we get the reward on earth, which is cool, but we will definitely experience a reward in eternity. If we are faithful. And so God will reward us. And plus, think about this. What's the worst thing that can happen to you as a Christian who is hated by, by other people. Now I understand that, in, especially in some parts of the world, this being a Christian and, and being a Christian who's sent out into the world, that could be a dangerous job. If you will, you could be in enemy territory. You could die for your faith. But think about this. Dead people aren't scared to die. Dead people aren't scared to die. As Christians, when we put our faith in Jesus, the Bible says that we actually die to our old life and then Jesus gives us a new life. We get that eternal life. What's that mean? It means we don't have, as Christians, we don't have to be scared of dying. We don't have to be scared of dying. And that's why the two witnesses, when the, when the Antichrist rises out, of, rises out of the bottomless pit and God's like, all right, you can kill them now. They aren't scared. Why aren't they scared? Because they realize that they have eternal life. When I was growing up, there was this Nintendo video game. It was called Contra. Anybody play this game? Mm -hmm. All right. This was, this, this was a war game 
where, especially in, in so, on some of the levels, there was like a million things shooting at you, trying to kill you as you were attempting to finish the level or finish the mission. And if you played Contra just straight up, if you just like logged on and pressed start button, one player or two player, you only got three lives to beat the game. It was a hard game, if you, especially with just using three lives. But, some of you guys know this, but there was a code. Somebody say there was a code. There was a code. Let's try it again. Somebody say there's a code. There's a code. If you put a code in at the right time, guess what? You got infinite lives. Now, Contra is a hard game with three lives. You got to be careful. You got you to jump and maneuver and be like real quick. You can't take risks. And plus, like anybody remember video games back in the day, like it's not like this anymore, but like the screen would follow you and like it would push you into the level. So you had to be, you got to be on it to play Contra. You can't take risks. And sometimes it'd be so hard you just want to give up. But when you have, and that's when you have three lives, but when you have infinite lives, you play Contra a little bit differently. You, you're not, you're not worried about dying because you know you're just going to come back up and you're good. And you just complete the mission. When you got infinite lives, you, lives, you do your job differently. And so church, I just want to tell you that, hey, if you are a Christian, the worst thing that can happen to you is you die for your faith. But you know what? You don't have to even worry about that. You don't have to worry about dying. You just need to do your job. You just need to go out into the world, preach the gospel, and make disciples. Because you know what? Jesus, he's our contra code. <coughs> he's our contra code. We, 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 Jesus is like, you know, at the right time, go up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, A, B. It's like, start. Boom. We got infinite lives. Now, some of you are like, wait a minute. That code sounds a little bit different. I thought it was up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, uh, A, B, start. Or B, A, start. But that's only for 30 lives. There was another code, Konami code, where you got 30 lives if you did that other code. So, so we're not going to talk about that code. The 30 life code is for those who believe you can lose your salvation, so you only get like partial. Uh, but we're talking about the eternal security code. That's the, that's the Contra code. That's the first code. I just threw myself under the bus. All right. But as the worship team, I'm going to call the worship team up. And, and, and so I, ho I hope this encourages you today. I, I hope that this passage can encourage you to, to live passionately for Jesus. To, to stop being afraid of all the things that could happen to us. And just do the job that the king has given us. Amen. And the king has given us this. Go tell people about me. Go tell people how much I love them. And how I died for their sins. And how I want to give them eternal life. And yes, we go out into a world where they don't really want the new king. But here's what's cool. We have the ability to change their mind through the preaching of the gospel, just like the two witnesses did. And God can use our lives. God can even use our deaths to move people toward God and give him glory. And so the king has given us an important job. So my question for all of us is, are we ready to get to work? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, that you, um, that we are yours. If we have put our faith in Jesus, that we, we, we are yours. We belong to you. And if we belong to you, we know that you're going to take care of us, God. And so uh, as we close today, Lord, I just pray that you would encourage all of our hearts to live boldly and passionately for you, Jesus. That we would take the job you've given us, even though it's a hard job and even though it's a hard message that isn't uh, uh, easily received by those around us. God, would you help us to do that hard job and, 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 and bring you glory, Lord, because we know that, that it involves others hearing the gospel and, 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 and through their response being brought into the kingdom. And really, that's the ultimate reward is to see our friends and our family and our neighbors come to know you, Jesus. And so that's what we want. And I know that's what you want in our lives. And that's what you want happening in our town, God. So please, would you work in that in us? Uh, work that in us this morning, God. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going to uh, end with the final song. And a lot of times we end up sort of a peaceful, quiet, reflective song, but uh, we just got done singing about a king who gives us eternal life. Um, he's got a kingdom, so I thought we'd uh, end on a little more of a song. If you want to stand, um, Please do. Uh, if you want to sit and, and pray, uh, that's fine as well. We're going to stop. We're going to end with uh, singing. Stop.